These are real flames, real danger. It was 50 years ago when he was riding through a tiny town in the hills of Virginia, far west of the nation's capital, peering out the window of the family car, a skinny kid on a long ride for a Sunday dinner. I started coming through the town when I was about six or eight years old. This building was one of three gas stations in the little village of 158 people here. And I guess the notion of going out to the country for a wonderful meal uh, was something that I loved even from that age. The family wanted a good meal, and made it a habit to motor west from the suburbs to a little place where they knew the food would be good, fresh, wholesome, plentiful. That's when Patrick O'Connell fell in love with the dining experience. Half century later, O'Connell is at the very top of American cuisine. If this was the movies, Patrick O'Connell would have won the Oscar several years in a row. What we try to do here at the end of Little Washington is give our guests something that hopefully they couldn't get anywhere else in the world. When that great food producer of the 20th century, the United States of America, someday leaves the chemical-laden, soil-destroying monoculture, then farms will look much as this one does. Sunnyside Farm in Northern Virginia. I think it was Wendell Berry says, you know, eating is an agricultural act. If that statement holds, then, then when you eat, you should be cognizant of where it's coming from who toiled, what they did, what they used, what they were thinking, what, you know, what, what was their purpose in doing this. Sunnyside Farm is a 425 acre experiment in farming for the next century and the one after that. Farming with kindness to the land and water while earning a good living for the farm family. That farmland will be lost if uh, somebody isn't farming it and isn't able to make enough money to make a decent living. On a large working farm, you need a battalion of heavy machines to do the work of fertilizing and aerating. On this farm, such work is done by these creatures, the chickens. American Leghorn, strutting and softly clucking, is also busy. While scratching, she is aerating. And after eating, she is fertilizing. Thus, the farmer here uses a mobile chicken coop. Call it the hen stream, if you will, to shift the flock from field to field for benefit of hen and rooster and for the benefit of the land. We try to be as efficient as possible through using all these different aspects of farming. Look at this picture on the farm. Now feel the dew on a firm and bright apple in the morning. And think of when the perfumes of summer lift you. When you do that, the big growling expense of behemoths that disc and spray and cultivate begin to look more and more old-fashioned, don't they? This is amazing to have such a huge, magnificent farm right outside the back door. A dream come true. And they, they are face to face in the field, chef learning from farmer, farmer learning from chef. That, uh, you're only gonna touch a very few of them or really make an effect on them. This, this 099 block is actually comprised of uh, over 20 varieties of apples, and uh, in part, um, the aim for you know putting so many different varieties was to do some experimentation with uh -huh. older heirloom, antique types of apples, uh -huh. um, <coughs> to see which ones had um, better pest and disease resistance, and uh, 
really, uh, in a lot of ways, organic orchardists have their hands tied. Um, the public has come to demand uh, fruit that is perfect in appearance, doesn't have any sort of uh, aesthetic problems with it. Uh -huh. And yet, uh, during the period when uh, uh, orchardists produce fruit without benefit of chemicals, modern uh, pesticides, uh, it, was, it was far more usual for people to accept a certain amount of cosmetic damage. This is a variety called Gold Rush. Such a firm texture. Yeah, this one is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very sweet, too. Yeah. Uh -huh. Tastes very much like a Golden Delicious. But... Uh huh. But a better texture. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. I just eat the whole thing. Yeah, it's... Would you like to eat it? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hold on to it so long. <laughs> I love just biting the whole fruit. <laughs> I'm used to dealing with people at market. They but you want know... me to slice off a little oh, piece. Oh, I see. But you know, you do tend to, as a kid, you're always worried about those damn sprays, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you these, you these, tend to always, I wonder if somebody washed this. If not, you're rubbing it on your mm -hmm. shirt, you know? So it's uh, refreshing to know that you can just graze yeah, out here. It's a little safer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. It is thought that at the time of the American Revolution that there were 7,000 varieties of apples thriving across North America. 6,000 of those are extinct. In cultivating 28 varieties, Sunnyside Farm works to sustain the gene pool while producing a delicious mouthful. It's amazing how much fruit is on such a small tree. One of the benefits of, of the dwarf trees, again, um, uh, apart from their ease of pruning um, and picking, is that they're, you're able to space them much closer together. Uh, and uh, probably on a per tree basis, you're not going to get the kind of yields that you would get with a standard size apple tree. I mean, certainly you're not going to. And yet, uh, from a per unit of area basis, per acre, you get comparable or greater yields. Mm -hmm. um, and the fruit is usually much nicer than on a standard tree because you have sunlight penetration, you have quick uh -huh. drying. Uh -huh. So, I mean, top working uh, some of the modern dwarfing rootstocks with some of the antique varieties kind of represents using you know, uh, the best of modern uh, uh, scientific techniques and, uh, and trying to use that to, to uh, also wed it with, uh, you know, some of the qualities of, of fruit that's mostly been forgotten. This is so fascinating because one of the things we do in the peak of apple season is sometimes to create an entire tasting menu, sort of showing how multidimensional the flavors of the apple are. We'll do nine courses, each uh, themed around showcasing the apple in a totally different context. Right. So you never actually get tired of eating apples. You're just eating them in such a range of, of flavors and textures. We'll start with an apple rutabaga soup, mm -hmm. uh, where the rutabaga and the apple are sort of balanced in flavor, but the apple's adding that sort of sweetness. Right. Um, and uh, then go on and finish with a, a flaming apple dessert that we'll, we'll do today. We've got one ingredient here, but maybe we could go look at uh, what possibly may be the other ingredient in Great. our soup. We've got Wonderful. some rutabagas growing down in the vegetable garden. Good. Humans have known it for a thousand years and more. The brawny cousin of the cabbage, the rutabaga or Swedish turnip. The humble rutabaga patch. Ah, one of my favorites. Yeah, I wish more people thought that way. <laughs> Oh, it's going to change. It'll, it's going to be rediscovered. You think? Oh, definitely. Well, this is, unfortunately, this is probably the best specimen I have right here. But it's not uh, bad at all. As, as we know, they get quite a bit bigger than this. Uh -huh. We got these ones in late, but it's a, rutabaga is an example of one of those vegetables that's not only underappreciated, but it uh, lasts a long time into the fall after mm, people yeah, are, it smells delicious. are uh, thinking that, that uh, fresh, fresh vegetables have mm. disappeared from mm -hmm. the scene. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonderful texture and taste. So it's actually such an elegant taste, I think. But I think uh, people um, associate it with uh, old uh, tenement apartments as in that stench in the hallways. The, the, the cabbage yeah. smell. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. and it, 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 there's also a fear factor because people think that they're, they have the, it's like a rock and that they're not going to be able to get through it. Oh, you know, uh -huh. there, there's, uh -huh. I've heard uh, comedy routines where they're <laughs> talking about you know, taking cleavers Undercooked. and axes and sending people out to. Uh, to cut the rutabaga. Uh -huh. Of course, that's not true. I mean, they're, they are firm textured, but uh, it's wonderfully versatile very versatile. Yes. It's a very versatile vegetable. Uh -huh. We use it grated with a potato, and we make a potato roasty, like uh -huh. a pancake. Oh, right. It adds another layer of flavor to the potato. Sure. And then crisps in a nice way. We've uh, 
looked at the apples and the, and the rutabagas, and I suppose you'll be wanting to... Uh, I better whip something up using both of them. Yeah. Sounds like a marriage made in heaven. <laughs> the Inn at Little Washington has been open for 25 years, has never advertised. No road signs point the way. It is filled weeks, months in advance. All of this by word of mouth. Word, that is, of excellence. Most customers must ride, as young Patrick O'Connell did, for an hour or two in the car just to get to the little town of Washington, Virginia, nearly 70 miles west of the nation's capital. The chef prefers that distance. It brings a certain commitment to the meal on the part of the diners. What we try to do here at the Inn at Little Washington is give our guests something that hopefully they couldn't get anywhere else in the world. Uh, so that plays heavily on the use of local indigenous ingredients, wild things, growing in the woods, taking advantage of everything that's right here at our fingertips, and uh, creating new, unusual juxtapositions of those foods. Since we were out at the farm and looked at rutabagas, which were a vegetable my mother used to cook, we were inspired to make this wonderful fall soup. So we have a cup of chopped carrot, a cup of chopped sweet potato, the rutabaga, the apple. In this case, we're using a Granny Smith apple, uh, a nice, durable, hard, uh, full-flavored apple, and some onion. And we're going to take uh, a good bit of butter and put it in our pan, melt it, and simply throw all the ingredients together on top of it. We'll let them cook a little bit in the butter and re release some of their liquids, concentrate their flavors, and sort of meld together. So we'll just dump everything together into the pot. So they're slightly softened and a little bit of their flavor is brought out. So after they've sweated down, we're going to add the chicken stock and then simmer the whole combination for about 25 minutes until the vegetables are tender and they'll look a little like this. Mm. Mm. You can begin to see that color taking uh, form now. We'll add a little bit of salt, a little pinch of cayenne pepper. Of course, that's depending on taste. You don't need any, but it perks things up a bit. And then the secret ingredient, maple syrup. Good quality Vermont maple syrup. We'll stir that together and then puree it any way that you like. We use a little handheld uh, mixer, blender, which is kind of fun. And you just push the button and all these little veggies are gonna be pureed and all their beautiful flavor will come out. And you'll see the soup now because of the carrot beginning to take on that gorgeous golden amber color that also is the color of fall. That beautiful pumpkin flavor. Then we'll strain this through a fine mesh and put it back on the heat and add some cream. Wonderful. Tastes like a very elegant French puree of elusive vegetables. Hard to identify, but in perfect balance. So this is a, a piece of equipment that uh, most people don't have in their homes, but uh, is the reason that restaurant food is also so elegant in its texture. Uh, we pass so many sauces and soups through this, what they call a chinoise or Chinaman's hat. Uh, so you simply drop the soup through and what comes out is a wonderfully rich, elegant, smooth, velvety puree. 
Then we'll add a little cream to that and we'll be done. We'll have our soup. You find that the guests have been in the car for a long time and they need a little something to take that jangled edge off as soon as they sit down. And nothing does it better than a little taste of a perfect seasonal soup. We try to do everything we can here to enhance the season, the moment, and a sense of place. All those rustic vegetables turning into something so elegant. That's the magic of cooking. So it's apple season here in the country. And what better thing to do with our wonderful apples uh, than to make a little apple tart. But uh, a different take on an apple tart. One that has almost an invisible crust. So it's actually made with a crepe batter. We call it a upside down apple skillet tart because it's made in a little skillet, uh, a little crepe type of skillet. We use Teflon for this. And we have a nice local Fiji apple. Granny Smith works just fine also. And there's really nothing to it. We're going to make the crepe batter in the blender, which we've done. And you just add a little flour, a butter, uh, sugar, and uh, milk. And you have a nice, smooth, very thin pancake batter, which actually serves as a kind of glue to hold the apples together. And we're going to sprinkle it with a little sugar and add a little cream, and it'll create a little caramelization right in the pan. We'll flip it over and take it to the table, flaming with Calvados and serving it with vanilla ice cream. So it's extremely light, wonderfully savory, and nothing to it, provided you do a little practice with the flipping of the pan. So we've peeled our apple, and we're going to use a mandolin, which is a great little thing to have at home because it slices perfectly. And for this, it's absolutely essential that your apples be evenly and uniformly sliced. So as you can see, this makes short work of it. It would be very time consuming to do 20 of these and slice all the apples by hand. When our apples are sliced like this, we're all set to go. And we'll warm up our little pan, put a little butter in. So our butter's melted, and we've coated the bottom of the pan. And using a ladle, we're going to put the batter in, let it roll around, let the batter set very slightly in the bottom of the pan. Then I'm going to begin arranging the apples in little concentric circles over top of my very wet pancake batter, which will glue them in place. Then we'll put it back on the heat. The wonderful thing about this is that you can make these in advance. You can then lay them out on a cookie sheet or sheet pan, warm them up again, and slip them off onto a plate. And they taste just as good as if they're freshly out of the pan. It took us years to figure that little trick out. But imagine if you had to make a dozen of these while your guests were waiting. See with this skewer how I'm able to rearrange the apples, line them up perfectly. So we have our sugar in this handy little sugar shaker. So it pours out perfectly evenly. And we'll get a nice little layer of sugar over these apples so that when we flip it, it will create a kind of golden caramel top to it. So if the um, pancake slips around nicely, chances are it may be cooperative and we'll flip for you. If it won't, you can cheat and simply invert a plate, uh, turn it upside down, shove it back into the pan and use that little trick. But uh, as you practice, you'll get adjusted to this. I suggest if you have a, a house pet, like a little cat, you bring her into the kitchen and any that fall on the floor, she can just nibble along. So there's no waste. So at this point, the bottom of the crepe is set, the apples are adhered, 
and we're ready to flip it over. There will be a thunderous round of applause from your children and let it rest for a minute until that sugar begins to melt with the butter. And then we put our cream in this handy little squirt bottle because we have total control um, of being able to spread a thin rope of the cream all around the edge to create this wonderful little caramel sauce. And you'll begin to see a golden, rich, nut brown color coming up from the combination of cream, uh, butter, and sugar all melting together and a kind of caramel aroma. So we'll flip it one more time and then we'll lay it out carefully onto the plate and then using our bamboo skewer we can adjust any little imperfections while the uh, tart is still warm. We've lost one little apple but as Julia Child used to say they'll never know what you were aiming for bring it to the table with pride. We'll put the ice cream right on that little spot. So it has a beautiful fall fragrance to it. It's light as a feather. You could eat 20 of these and not be full. So when we take it to the table, preferably in a darkened room, we light a little bit of Calvados or apple brandy, which is a little hard to see in this light. Then we just, without burning ourselves completely up, we sprinkle the flames over the apple tart. And suddenly we think it's 1958 again, and we're living high. Uh, so with the flaming tart, then we'll put a little scoop of vanilla ice cream in the center, and that will sort of melt and create a kind of sauce. So you have this wonderful apple flavor. Beautiful thing about this is the apples, as you can remember, were completely raw when they went onto the tart. So, caution your guests also. You want to wait until the flames die out before you jump into your mouth with this. Mm. You have the icy cold ice cream melting on the burning tart. And you can't stop eating it. No one has ever not finished one of these. It is the contention of the organic farmer that one can produce fine food, clean of toxins, completely natural in flavor and nutrition, without chemicals and machinery. The finest foods humans enjoy come from the hands of the farmer, the hands of the chef, and complete only when tasted by the farmer and, we'll give it a little taste. and tasted by the chef. Wonderful. 